that everyone should be drinking more and wine. I ended up dropping out of Harvard Medical School to become a sommelier. I spent a decade plus in Michelin restaurants all over I, the country. I want to be people's guide, hold their hand, and walk them into the world of wine. And <laughs> Welcome back to the conversation. We're here today with Kristen Olszewski from Nomadico Wines. Kristen, thanks for joining us today. So excited to be here. I love getting started with the broad question of what's the most important message you want to share today with our audience? So I think the biggest message that I want to get across is that everyone should be drinking more wine. Um, it's <laughs> That's my mission in life to just bring consumers back to the wine category. Outstanding. And, and how do you, how are you trying to get that done? What's the mission behind Nomadica? Yeah. So I guess to, to back up a little bit, I'll give a little context on my own history and how I, how I came here. So I, uh, my undergrad degree is in sustainable agriculture and I ended up dropping out of Harvard medical school to become a sommelier as you know, typical journey. Um, <laughs> and just really fell in love with wine um, I worked in restaurants to pay for school and wine was always the thing that captivated my interest. I feel like it's the intersection of, you know, history and agriculture and gastronomy. And then also there's something so fun and communal and it's, you know, you're getting a little tipsy. It's, it's everything. Um, but I spent a decade plus in Michelin restaurants all over the country, everywhere from three Michelin stars, Saison in San Francisco, Husk in Nashville, Austria Moza here in LA. And um, when Nancy Silverton was on a Netflix show called Chef's Table, I started noticing a different customer coming into the restaurant. Um, usually as a sommelier, you're talking to a very specific demographic of people. I would say 45 plus male uh, white wine collector like that, that's my demo. And when Nancy was on chef's table, young people started coming into the restaurants, a lot of women. And I noticed they didn't want to drink wine. They would drink tequila, beer, cocktails, like anything but wine. And that always felt like such a miss because wine, it's the most ancient beverage. Like our people have drank wine for millennia. It's also in an age where we care about what's natural, what's minimally processed, what's better for you. Great wine is literally just grapes, yeast, water, and time, you know? So I started digging into like, why aren't you drinking wine? Um, and I found out a few things. One, people felt like wine wasn't a good value. Like if you weren't going to spend a lot of money on wine, you couldn't get a great wine, which is untrue. And the other one is people feel like they needed a PhD or some level of education or knowledge in order to access wine, which is again not true like i i want to be people's guide hold their hand and walk them into the world of wine and so i started nomadica to do that on a larger level that's beautiful that's amazing good for you i uh i'm glad you're helping a, a wider audience find good wine uh you mentioned two things we're gonna go to both your background in michelin restaurants i've heard heavenly amazing stories i've heard horror stories um, can you share whether it's a heavenly amazing story or a horror story and what you learned from that experience? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, everyone always asks me if I watch the bear or not. And I'm like, no, I can't. It's like too real. Um, I will say I'm, I'm going to share some positive ex stories. I do think Michelin restaurants have changed a lot. From when I started working in them, I think work has changed a lot for the the positive. I will say uh, some some Michelin experiences. I remember one of my first serious jobs in a scary restaurant. And, you know, you have your hair pulled back, obviously, because you don't want it to get in the food. And I had like one small piece of hair hanging down above my face. And the, the chef was like, Kristen, come here, come here. And I was like, yeah, chef, like terrified of this, of this chef. Um, he's like, no, no, come here. Takes a match from the stove, lights it to my piece of hair. And then he's like, don't ever have a hair hanging down in your face again. Um, 
some of the so the wonderful stories are having the opportunity, especially at Moza. You know, you taste each bottle you open there. So when I was at Moza, it was a five million dollar all Italian seller um, with like ninety pages of the best Barolo, Brunello, you know, Etna Rosso's, just things that like collectors dream about tasting. And I feel so lucky to have tasted things like Conterno Monfortino, which is the type of wine that you want to smell for like three hours before you drink it. It's just such a, when you have a wine like that, it makes you realize why collectors obsessively chase bottles, you know, um, there's something so romantic and intangible and like having a wine like that, you realize you'll never have a wine that tastes the same at any moment in time ever again. It's just such a, such a lucky experience. I love that. Um, what I'm curious about is how that experience inspired you to open Nomadica. Is there a direct correlation there for you? Yeah. So, you know, my entry point into wine was always through farming. So as I mentioned, I majored in sustainable agriculture. Um, I was an avid farmer, like I ran our community garden in college and was focused on permaculture. I lived in India and farmed for a while there. And I always say great wine is made by great farmers. Great wine's made in the vineyard, not the cellar. Um, and so when I was looking at starting Nomadica, that sustainability ethos like it was always my starting point. But I was really shocked when I found out how bad glass bottles are for the environment. Uh, 30% of glass is recycled in the U.S. The rest just goes into a landfill. It's highly energy intensive to make, to ship because it's so heavy. And the fact is most wine does not need to be in a glass bottle. Yes, that Barolo I mentioned, absolutely, that needs to be in a glass bottle. That needs to be aged for years before it even comes into its own. But for a $20, $30 bottle of wine that you're going to, you know, pop open and drink it mm -hmm. on a weeknight or on like a not special weekend does not need to be in glass. And so that's kind of how we started. So cans are a 70% reduction in carbon footprint. And then our newly launched bag and box wine is almost a 90% reduction in carbon footprint. That's incredible. I, I did not know those statistics. So that's amazing. I think the wine community, as well as the, let's call it the lower level, the more dinner party, happy to drink community needs to hear that as well, because I'm just not sure that we're as aware of that as we should be. We're talking today with Kristen from Nomadica Wines. Kristen, I think I sampled your sparkling white, your red, and your rosé. They were dangerously drinkable. Congratulations on making some delicious wines. Can we talk about where the fruit is sourced from? Absolutely. So the name Nomadica is really a fun double entendre because... You can take it wherever you want to go, of course. Cans and boxes can, can be found in places that bottles can't. But also we source our fruit from all over. We're truly a nomadic winery. Um, our head winemaker, Corey Alberry, spent time at some of the best uh, wineries in California, like Eric Kent Cellars, which makes award-winning Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and also Costa Brown, if you know, you know. Um, but before that, he spent 10 years doing vineyard management in California. So through Corey, we've really got a handle on some of the best fruit. Uh, a lot of our wine comes from Mendocino. A lot of our grapes come from Mendocino or Lodi. But of course, I'm such a Sonoma girly. Our our winery is located in Sonoma. And so I always find myself drawn back to that region. Are there any vineyards you recommend us touring when we come up to Northern California? I'm just like such a big fan of the Sonoma Coast. I think the Sonoma Coast is the best wine region in California. Um, they've fought very hard to become designated as their own AVA, which is very important in terms of quality. The oceanic influence, the what we call a diurnal shift, so the extreme temperature change between night and day on that region, like Hirsch and Litteri, I think if anyone ever wants to see proof in the pudding of what great farming can do, you need to go see Litteri. Ted Lemon was one of the first Americans to ever be a winemaker in Burgundy, and he 
brought all of his practices back, was one of the first people to practice biodynamic agriculture in California and is really like brought that style of farming onto a larger scale. And when you go visit his vineyards, it's like teeming with life. And you look next door at a conventionally farmed plot, which is just kind of like dead and sad looking. And then you taste the wines and you're just knocked on your butt because they're so good. You're a very visual storyteller. I love it. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> we're with Christian from Nomadica Wines. We tasted through several. Can you walk us through the taste profiles of any of your favorites from the white, rosé, red, et cetera? When we're tasting these, what are, what's the aromas? What are the profiles? Talk us through your favorites. Yeah. So something really cool about our wines is everything's practicing organic. So no pesticides, no synthetic fertilizers. All of our wines are fermented dry. So they're naturally zero grams of sugar per serving. Um, so our wines are not sweet. They have nice fruit notes, but none of the wines are sweet. And then I really like crushable, bright flavor. So across the gamut, our entire portfolio has a has a brightness and a freshness to it. Um, all of our wines are like slightly aromatic because I just, I love an aromatic variety. But part of the thought that we put behind the brand is that I wanted to take that sommelier curation, that sommelier experience and put it on, you know, the restaurant or retail shelf so that when you're serving Nomadica at your home, at your, you know, parties and the beach, 99% of people will love it because I'm doing the work in the back end on blending, on sourcing, on creating these flavor profiles that's really taking that wine expertise that, you know, decade plus of developing my own palate and giving it back to the consumer. I think when you, a lot of people have ran into alternative packaging in the last few years. And I think a big difference between us and them is, you know, there are a lot of people with MBAs or that come from investment banking backgrounds. And, you know, that's great. It's validating for everything, but there's no mistaking for 10 years in the field. Like these people have not tasted the wines that I have. These people have not developed the palate that I have or my team has. And I think that really shows up in our product. But I really feel like I've, I've achieved something. And that with sushi is a mind blowing pairing. And then our red, I love it. We found Toraldigo growing in Northern California, which is a grape that's indigenous to Northern Italy from the Alto Adige. Um, it's really alpine, kind of like dark fruit, like a Zinfandel, but really like refreshing and bright acidity and a little bit more tannin than a Zin has. Ooh. Yes. It's like whenever I pour it for people, because there's a perception that we had to overcome about Canon boxed wine. Of course, people think that it's low quality. They think that it's value. And so any wine knowledge any palate can distinguish cheap red wine cheap red wine is the most disgusting thing on the face of the earth in my humble opinion and whenever i pour our red for somebody the response is always wow oh my god that's so good and i'm like yes like no matter your level of wine knowledge you can see what i'm trying to do when you taste our red wines very well said i think something you said well first before i get into that I just wanted to say, uh, you have restaurants, you said you have a restaurant opening up soon. I would love to document that experience. And so when you're ready to share more about that, the, the menus, location, launch date, et cetera, please come back because that'd be an amazing second conversation to have with you. Uh, something you said way back early on in this conversation is your Michelin experience inspired you to open up to a wider audience, to more people who don't necessarily, maybe they're not as comfortable with wine as you'd like them to be. And I love that. And I want to applaud you for having that idea because I think you're right that so many people out there should be having better wines and there is an intimidation to it. And what I wanted to say is I feel that between your cans, your boxes and how you share your message, you are achieving your goal. And so I wanted to ask, other than the restaurants and the orange wine, what's next for you in Nomadica? So right now we're in hardcore expansion mode. 
we, again, we were the first people to do fine wine and can, and I grew really slowly at my own pace. I wanted to build the brand. Um, a lot of people just run to retail shelves and they want to be in every grocery store on the planet. I didn't want that. I wanted to be, you know, at the Four Seasons, at the Ritz Carlton, at music venues. I wanted to be in places where people don't typically expect to see wine in can or in box. And so we have done that. We are one of the highest velocity items at Whole Foods in our category. Um, we just launched all of our box wines at Total Wine in California, Texas, Florida, Colorado, and New York. And got some really big plans for next year. So keep your eyes peeled. People are about to see me everywhere. That's my goal. Huge congratulations. Just for someone who's maybe less aware, hasn't thought of it, and I'm assuming, so if I'm wrong, please correct me. Having a canned wine at some of these nicer hotels, I'm assuming it's a challenge to make that happen. And so if it is from a business point of view, what did you learn? What lesson did you learn by accomplishing that rather large challenge? So I think that's the that's the best thing about how we're positioned. You know, not only am I a sommelier, my VP of sales is a sommelier. My winemaker has an incredible reputation. Every person on my team comes from the wine industry and we have the best product. And so I think that when we're sitting down and tasting with these buyers, these people that are in our industry, they recognize it. You know, I always say taste out of a wine glass, everything tastes better out of a wine glass. And the second that they taste it, you know, these are people who taste wine all the time and they taste a lot of bad wine. And so that has been amazing. We've always had the industry behind us. Uh, again, it's like a huge differentiator for us. So I think it, it was slow. It was slow to build. Uh, everything takes a lot more time than you think it will, which is, I think, the biggest lesson that I've taken away from this business over the last seven years. But you got to build your brand first. Well, speaking of your brand, anyone who's getting to know you is inspired by your energy. And so if somebody out there who's just learning about you now wants to learn more, websites, social media, et cetera. What are the best ways to follow your journey and to learn more about you? So you can buy New Attic online um, and our new Rosé Yuzu Spritz, which is delicious, uh, at explorenomatica.com. And then our socials are at Nomatica on Instagram. And if you want to follow me, sometimes I post fun wine things. Uh, it's at Kristen with an I-N underscore underscore O. <laughs> Perfect. And just because you do seem like a deep souled individual, whether it's wine, whether it's, and I don't want to go back to the mission stuff, although I'm sure there's tons of content there, but is there an overall message that you want to share to inspire the audience or to get them to try a new can of yours? Yeah. I mean, I do think we are in a time where sustainability is more important than it ever has been. I think you know, you can't base your entire brand about it, but I think it's an absolutely necessary component to any consumer product good that's coming out today. And so one of my like missions in life is to have that conversation about sustainability and have it with other brands because it needs to be convenient. Otherwise, consumers will not care or participate or choose the sustainable option. So like that's my it's my big thing. <laughs> I love it. And I think that the name you chose, the message behind it, it all just correlates so well. So clearly is well planned out. Cheers, Kristen. Thank you so much for sharing your message today. I appreciate you coming by and visiting. Thanks for having me on, Joe. This is so fun.